know it or not. It's a story they'll hear from shepherds. It's an impossibly true encounter with God discovered in a stable and nothing will ever be the same. We'll hear a cry from a teenage mother giving birth. We'll listen to the consoling words of a father who himself needs consolation. And we'll experience the birth of a child, the birth of this child, and nothing will ever be the same. The extravagant lengths to which our God will go to be born into this night, into this darkness and into this dirt, and all to prove to us, even as we're running away from him, just how wildly he loves us and pursues us. Nothing will ever be the same because nothing can ever be the same. So may the familiarity of this event never lull us to sleep. May we awaken this year to the new life being offered by this Prince of Peace. May our eyes be opened wide to see the gospel wrapped in flesh, this news that truly is the best news we could ever hope to receive. For we are the ones who are waiting, whether we know it or not. We are the ones whose hearts long to hear and hear again the story the shepherds are telling. We have become the recipients of the wild pursuit of God. He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our joy. He is our love. And because of Jesus, because of this child and all that he'll become, nothing will ever be the same. Christmas season it has me um, thinking about uh, all the gifts that we receive in life that are so good. Uh, I, I think this morning we've already received quite a gift. I tell you what, watching our uh, peer and um, uh, some of our youth, you know, uh, lead us in worship uh, in violin. Uh, I, that is that's a gift, isn't it? Can we give them a hand again? Very awesome. You know, I was uh, thinking about some of these gifts that we've been given. Uh, kind of a little bit of a behind-the-scenes thing, but uh, in our church uh, leadership here at the church, we we brought on a new role in life of the church. That that role has been uh, done here. We call it an outside elder is the term that we use for it. We have a great group of elders. I don't know, for some, some of you might not know how our church functions, but... We have a, a group of um, uh, paid, paid ministers, paid staff, essentially, and then we have a group of uh, elders who are lay people who will oversee the, the paid staff and their leadership and how things are being done. And, uh, and uh, one of the roles that we have uh, is uh, we brought on this new role called an outside elder, somebody who's not from this church who can kind of maybe speak into us from a different set of lens, you know, a different perspective. Uh, this year, we uh, brought on a man uh, named... And Dale is, uh, not only is he not uh, uh, part of our church, he's way outside of our church, at least geographically. Uh, Dale lives uh, lived way back in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana, some thousand miles away from here. So they are very far removed from us. And uh, in fact, we have some native uh, Indiana people in the house today. And so, you know, just how far that distance is, especially if you're driving it. But... Um, yeah, uh, the thing about Dale kind of stepping into this role as an outside elder for our church is that uh, there's very little in it for him. Uh, he, <laughs> he doesn't get a whole lot of um, bonuses, if you will, by being a part of our elder group. He, he's a pastor of a church in Indianapolis, so he already has a whole congregation that he's trying to lead and, and uh, uh, staff and others he's trying to lead. He, he has his own meetings that he goes to once a month, his own board meetings and things like that, as well as other meetings. Uh, so, you know, there's not a whole lot of incentive for him because uh, pretty sure last time I checked, uh, whenever you get a raise as an elder, it's the same pay you were already getting, which is nothing, <laughs> zero. So, uh, uh, not to mention, he's in Eastern time zone, so when our sometimes long meetings end at 8 o'clock or so, our time, it's 10 o'clock, his time in Eastern zone. So he just didn't have a whole lot to, 
gain from being a part of our church, uh, and yet he's come and he accept, accepted the challenge. He was out here for our annual meeting uh, earlier this year, and uh, whenever we do meet, we meet with him on Zoom in the, in the, in the, in the boardroom, and it's a, it's a very thing. So it's just super, super gracious. You know, he kind of uh, uh, came a long way, if you will, to help us out here at the church, and uh, uh, Dale uh, is, uh, you know, not the only person I've ever experienced that kind of thing with in life. I don't know about you, but maybe you've known people who didn't have a whole lot to gain by coming alongside you and helping you out, maybe sacrificed a lot to pour into you or to, to help you out, um, and yet they went a long way to come alongside you. I don't know. Those, those kind of people I have a lot of respect for and, and a lot of um, uh, gratitude for. Their help in our lives. Uh, and, you know, as we are in this Christmas season, this Advent season, uh, we see so clearly how indeed God came a long way to help us out. Can, can, can anybody say amen? Yeah. Amen. He came a long way to help us out. I don't know if there's a better uh, picture that's painted in Scripture about how far God came to help us out than in uh, one of his disciples' uh, testimony of Jesus' life. John, he uh, wrote a gospel account of Jesus and his experience with Jesus over the course of three years or so. And John chapter 1 is this great text which speaks about just how far God came to help us out and to, to meet us where we are. It uh, starts off this kind of epic beginning Uh, In the beginning, the Word, speaking of Jesus, whenever it refers to the Word, in the beginning, the Word already existed. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And so we see this idea that there was was God, the Father, and then there was the Word, Jesus. And they were there together before time in the beginning. And the Word was God. So not only was Jesus there with the Father, but he was equal in his standings with God in his godness. He was just as much God as the Father. And he existed in the beginning with God. And God created, the Father created everything through him, this partnership of the Father and the Son. In in also other places we hear the Holy Spirit. This is chapter 1. I don't know what my mic's doing. It keeps cutting in and out. Trying to make sure it doesn't have this thing here. Hey, can you get that, uh, that other handheld? I think it's right here by Archer. I think I'll just use that. This guy's being fun. But, but uh, God created everything through him. The Father created through Jesus, and nothing was created except through him. And so this great picture begins to develop of just how far God came. First of all, before time began... Uh, sometimes when we think about what that was like, it's hard. We're like, well, what was it like before creation? And the way that I like to think about it is uh, my mind used to think about before creation as like darkness, blackness, voidness, because of some of the language we hear in Genesis chapter 1. But that's speaking about the beginning of creation being darkness and blackness and voidness. But before creation, there was God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is light, right? God is glory. He is He is uh, fulfillment and satisfaction and and awesomeness and holiness and glory. There was beauty before creation. These three were in partnership as God, and I'm imagining things were pretty awesome, pretty wonderful. But then God creates everything and does so through this partnership, Father, through the Son. And then we hear later in John's Gospel that verse 9 Speaking again of Jesus, the one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, here's where it gets pretty amazing. The God who created everything was coming into the world. He came into the very world that he created. This is the, test, this is the Christian faith, right? This is what we believe. Jesus was God. God stepping, coming from outside of our world, into our world. Coming from outside the world he created, into the world he created. The word became flesh and lived among us. And we, speak John, speaking of himself and the other disciples, we gazed upon his glory. 
glory like that of the Father's only Son, full of grace and full of truth. And so, thinking about how far God came to help us out. The scriptures say that he was God who created everything outside of creation even. We learn that in other places. Yet he stepped into creation and walked among us. This last little piece of John chapter 1, we'll look at verse 18, explains to us how God wanted us, how far he came because he wanted us to understand who he was, what he was like. No one has ever seen God. That is in all of his glory, all of his might here in this fallen world. But the one and only Son, who himself, who is himself God, is in closest relationship with the Father. He has made him known. He has revealed to us, Jesus has, what God is like. In other words, what God is like in human terms, if he were to put on human flesh, what God, what God be like, that's who Jesus is. Uh, you know, the Christian faith is the, is, the, is the only faith where God comes in human form. Not, not, a, not, a, not a vision, uh, not a, you know, quasi-human, like a, God, like a uh, oh, what do you call it, a, um, a demigod or something like that. No, the Christian faith is the only faith where God comes and puts on human flesh. It's fully human. In other words, he functions like we do as humans in all of our humanness. The Christian faith is the only faith that proclaims this. Now, Eastern religions allow, don't, really allow, don't really allow for the possibility of a, a personal communion with God, this kind of interaction with God, where God would show up and talk with you, engage with you. Uh, there are other religions in the world that do speak of a personal God, uh, such as uh, the Islamic faith and others, right? There's, there's Allah and the, the view that this is a personal God, but, but that personal God stays kind of removed and far away. Allah did not become flesh. And yet the Christian faith says that God, in all of his godness, came and stepped into his creation and became one of us. Uh, Timothy Keller a uh, great man of the faith who passed away earlier this year, he, he said it well when he said this. He said, I become convinced, Timothy Keller quote, do we have that? I become convinced that what makes the difference for Christianity is the incarnation, God becoming human. No other faith says God became flesh like we are flesh. Think about the great phrase from Charles Wesley's Christmas hymn, veiled in flesh. The Godhead see. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this. It's just a couple months ago, but in October, the eclipse that happened. Did anybody get out and actually see the eclipse with, hopefully with some kind of sunglasses? Um, we ha our neighbors were so kind to our kids. Uh, yeah, you guys saw it, huh, Archer? Yep. Our neighbors were so kind to our kids, they let us use a pair of sunglasses. We didn't have anything. We weren't fully aware on what was going on, but we didn't know. I stepped outside, and I was like, whoa, the lighting's really weird. What's going on? <laughs> Is Jesus coming back today? What's, what's the deal? It was, it was strange because it hadn't yet happened. You could see the sun still. Um, anyway, our neighbor was like, hey, we got glasses. You know, come over. So we got glasses, and uh, we all took ch a turn looking at the eclipse once it happened. And um, the... The idea here that Wesley communicated in that song, veiled in flesh the Godhead see. He didn't say veiled in flesh the Godhead uh, hidden. He said veiled in flesh the Godhead see. In other words, we can see who God is, his glory, but kind of it's veiled, right? It's like it's, it's, it's somewhat hidden, kind of like the sun with an eclipse. You can look at it, especially if you've got the right glasses, and yet, that's not the sun in all of its glory, right? We, we can't look at the sun in all of its glory with our natural eyes. At least we shouldn't, because it will be a bad result. Uh, now, scriptures kind of communicate this, too, that in our sinful condition, we can't see God in his full glory. It wouldn't work out well for us in this, this human body. 
uh, the way that it is, tainted by sin. And yet, God came a long way so that we could see what he is like. And Jesus is God in all of his glory and all of his might and power and right brilliance and all those things, but veiled in flesh, kind of, you know, hidden in a way that we can receive it, that we could touch him and talk with him and, and engage with him as his disciples did in that day. Pretty cool deal. God came a long way to help us out. There's, this, there's another great passage, the last one we'll kind of look at this morning, but in Isaiah chapter 40 where it speaks about the greatness of God and just how, how miraculous this event is. It's not a big deal if your view of God is that he's about this big or maybe he's a little bigger than me. Most everybody's bigger than me, but maybe that he's a little bit bigger than me. But, but if, you, if you understand who God is, how great he is, according to what the scriptures say about him, then this event becomes more remarkable. Listen to this description of who God is. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? Speaking about God. In other words, all of the oceans, all of the rivers, all of the lakes and streams, all of the water under the ground, all the water on this planet, God holds it in the hollow of his hand, just kind of rolls it around. This is a description of, of how great and glorious God is. Even more than that, who has marked off the heavens with the span of his hand? Meaning what? Who can take the thumb and forefinger and mark off the universe, the cosmos, the billions and billions of galaxies that we know of? Who can do that? God can. And yet we get to this awesome quote again from Charles Wesley. He was such a great hymn writer. And he says this, Charles Wesley says, our God contracted to a span. What kind of span? Incomprehensibly made man. The God who spans the universe in his hands contracted down, 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 all the way, incomprehensibly made man. Now, This is the incarnation, that God, not less than God, but God became man. Amazing, amazing stuff. And God came a long, long way to help us out, and, and we can see evidence of, we can see evidence of this uh, in many ways. The scriptures say creation shows us. But we can see evidence of his arrival, God becoming man, and some very tangible human tools or resources that we use on a regular basis. Did you know, fact check me, feel free, did you know that Jesus is the central figure in recorded human history? The records we have and keep as humans. He is the central figure in recorded human history. Uh, historically speaking, when it comes to speaking about the recorded history that we as humans keep and have, it surfaces that Jesus is the central figure of recorded human history. No human has been more well-documented, written about, discussed in modern times or ancient than Jesus of Nazareth. Now, that to me would make sense if indeed he was God who can span the universe contracted down into a man. Fully God, fully man. I would think that something about who that person was would get recorded quite often, in fact, more than anything else. Not only that, the Bible is the most significant book in human history. Did you know the Bible is the number one seller of all time? They say estimated, I don't, they're not going to have a hard number here, estimated 7 billion copies over time, nearly a copy for every person on the planet, the most widely published book in all of human history. And you go back and you say, yeah, I know part of that is the printing. 